Morning again, everyone. Um, today I'm going to introduce Emma Swan from Thrive Safe, who will be our speaker this morning. Um, I hope you enjoy it. She's got a really, really interesting topic to talk about. Um, and there'll be some time for questions and answers afterwards. So um, I'll leave you in Emma's hands and come back then. Thank you. Hello. Um, so for those who weren't around the little table with me, um, I might have to keep muting and co just coughing because I've had this stupid cough. So please bear in mind, I apologise. It's not nice, um, but hopefully I'll get through and it'll be OK. Um, I'm just going to switch over and share my screen. Just I've got some slides prepared. So um, bear me two seconds while I get that sorted. And hopefully... Marie, is that all coming up okay? Yeah, I can see your screen. It looks, it's on the um, AirMeet tab at the moment, though. It's not on your PowerPoint. Oh, it should be on my, this is what I had for issues. Right, let's try again. Right, let's try again. That's it. There we go. Cool. Lovely. Right. So, yes, yeah, so I'm Emma Swan. I work with Thrive Safe and um, we are about raising awareness on domestic abuse, sexual violence and improving the response to people with mental health or trauma related needs. So we offer workshops on lots of information topics, proactive wellness planning. So looking at being quite advanced in starting the conversation early rather than waiting for crisis and then having follow on support through one to one sessions. So that would be with either managers that need help or if there's employees with identified support needs that want some signposting and a bit of guidance of where they can get support. My specific experience is across a mixture of sectors. So some of that is research in the police and also at the local councils. So some criminal research and also then looking at some social trend work and then direct support with survivors of domestic violence and also sexual violence, including at high risk points and crisis support. So that's kind of where my background comes in. So today we're going to talk about some generally potentially sensitive topics. So just to kind of let you know that some of it will refer to abuse and harm, but it won't go into a lot of detail. But there will be some information at the end about a couple of support services and some 24 hour helplines if you do want to talk to anybody. And obviously, I'm always happy to have that conversation as well. I will share some statistics. I always say just be cautious with taking them literally because some data misses out certain groups or it has age limits on it that isn't always known about. So they're there to be a general guide, but they may not always be completely exact. Um, so I'll just refer to those a little bit later on. So the kind of key topic content today really is about understanding the boundaries. So primarily in the workplace, but also looking at how that crosses into personal boundaries. Some information, as I say, about statistics of prevalence of domestic and sexual violence, and also looking at how historic experiences of harm or trauma can have a present day impact in ways that we're maybe not always aware of. And also looking at strategies we can take as individuals and companies to better protect people moving forward. So first of all, realistically, we need to look at what boundaries are. So the Oxford language's definition refers to a clear boundary. So that could be something quite physical, like a county boundary, or it might be something that's a bit more abstract. So this could be something like your emotional boundary, something people can't see or touch. So when we think about what boundaries look like, we need to understand what they are for us and what they are for others. And there are different components of that. So we have emotional boundaries. So things we're happy to talk about or not talk about, things we want to keep private. We have physical boundaries, the clear boundary that is our body and our skin and our texture, but also how we feel physically to be safe. And then there's the element of that sexual contact as well. So, of course, that may relate to physical contact, but that also could be about sexual language or general behaviour towards people. And then there's another strand, which is looking at our spiritual boundaries. So that could be how we feel about religion, life, spirits, whatever it is that we believe. And we have to respect and have tolerance within those boundaries with each other. So what I would generally start with is looking at when we think about how we potentially engage with others, is who is this contact for? So in any of those categories, if you are engaging with somebody in any of those four areas, we want to look at what the motivation is. Is this because it benefits you? Is it mutually excuse exclusive if it's something that's consent based that you've spoken about? So, for example, 
I've worked with someone before who didn't like to be hugged. We're quite a huggy office and we all had this agreement that actually you know, we have to agree who wants to be hugged and who doesn't. And they can be really simple things that help people have autonomy to be safe in the workplace. And as I said earlier, this does also then cross into personal life. So how some people behave socially with their friends and family will be very different potentially to how they are at work. And we need to understand that people can draw boundaries in all the different areas of their life. And they don't necessarily have to explicitly tell you about them. So we cannot make presumptions about what is OK for somebody. Often you'll hear people use the word banter and they would talk about language or behaviours. Oh, it's just banter. It's just funny. It's, you know, it's OK. It's all a bit of a laugh. But what we need to think about is not traumatising people and not giving them reasons to feel unsafe in our presence. So actually, it should really be a natural presumption to not physically approach or touch somebody because we need to think about someone's physical safe spaces in the same way you wouldn't suddenly delve into someone's potential past traumas. And what we need to be more than anything else is accountable to our behaviour is if we make an error or if we get a judgment wrong, if we haven't asked a question, actually apologising is important. And it's important to remember that that might not be in that person's best interest to do that directly. And I'll come on to some policies and signposting and stuff later about that. So when we think about boundaries and understanding, the iceberg concept is a really simple way of demonstrating this is because what we see can be often very different to what is going on for that person in their mind or in their body at that time. So if, for example, you took a situation and applied somebody who has been through sexual violence, perhaps they have been assaulted on a one to one basis in a room, just them and a the door was shut then their behaviour may present as quite nervous if they're pulled into, say, a one-to-one -one with the manager. Because behind for them, their feelings and thoughts relate to feelings of unsafety when they're in a one-to-one -one situation in a room with somebody, from a direct experience of that trauma. And also because their core belief and their narrative will now inform them that being one-to-one -one in a room is unsafe. And that's not a conscious thought, it's something that's going on in the background. And I'll give you a bit of a demonstration with the brain in a second as to what's occurring. And what we don't want to do is make presumptions of where somebody is safe just because we feel OK in that. And the intention we have can sometimes be irrelevant because what can happen is we can think something's well intended, like, you know, just running and giving someone a hug. But for them to be physically touched suddenly might be quite traumatising or shocking for them. And everybody has a different window of tolerance. So when we think about kind of like a peak well-being state, if we go above that into a space of stress or anxiety or just being overstimulated, we'd call that hyperarousal. And that's an area that can be quite erratic in our thinking and we feel quite unsafe. On the opposite end of that, you then have somebody who's potentially in a flat mood and feels quite out of control in a way where they don't feel in control of their autonomy and their choices. So what we want to work with is understanding that we don't get to decide for anyone and also that you don't have to have been through trauma to deserve the respect of your boundaries and your safe spaces, because we also don't want to traumatise people moving forward. So just from a prevalence perspective, to give a bit of an overview of who might have hidden trauma in the workplace, for domestic abuse and, and domestic violence, the general numbers are about one in four women and one in six men. There are one million calls to police a year, which works out at about one every 30 seconds. And on average, it takes 50 incidents of abuse before somebody seeks help. And that's not necessarily reporting. That could just be reaching out to a friend or family. And for sexual violence, for adults over six, well, they say adults, but they count it from 16 because of crime reporting. It's 20 percent of women and 4 percent of men and suggested that only 15 percent actually make reports to police. So, again, if we think of prevalence, a lot of people may be not recognising domestic or sexual violence. So these numbers are likely to be a lot higher. 40% of adults who are raped tell nobody and one in 20 children experience childhood sexual abuse and that trauma will ultimately progress into adulthood. So if we were to really merge all these numbers really roughly, then you could say between a fifth and a quarter of the staff that you may be engaging with may actually have been through a direct experience of trauma in some format. So the way this works in the brain, in a very simple level to strip it back for the sake of today, we have these three key areas of our brain that work on a threat assessment. And the APEP theory is a really simple way to understand what happens when we're in an environment and how we basically assess how we feel about it. It's not conscious. It happens in nanoseconds before we've even become aware of a trigger coming into the room. So if we were to take a stimulus or an incident or a situation, uh, imagine, say, a tiger suddenly being in front of you, then we use the hippocampus, which is this back part of our brain, 
to basically go through an archive of information. And then we have the amygdala, which is the threat assessor. And that is there to basically um, assess with all that information how we feel about it. Now, if we're calm and if we feel OK, the prefrontal cortex, this top part of our brain at the very front kind of at this area, will generally make a rational, calm decision about how we move away from it. So if the tiger is behind a glass door at the zoo, then, you know, ultimately you can just move on. However, if this tiger is presented when you're in the middle of a field, then your brain is going to go into a panic response of I need to get out of this alive. So the thinking doesn't always happen. And this can replicate in really micro behaviours. If you take it back to the sexual violence situation of a one to one with the manager in the room, the trigger could actually be the door shutting. So that's something where that person might instantly just feel unsafe. And that's because of this kind of pattern matching. So just be mindful that we don't see what the thought processes are that people are having. So what can we do moving forward? Professional boundaries and trauma or abuse awareness training are really important. We need to make people aware of what harm we could cause or what harm someone may have been through and about making sure that there's just a flat line respect for everybody's boundaries. Having a strong policy. This policy could be about having positive behaviour at work making positive environments to work in for everybody, looking at domestic abuse awareness policies and what the protocol would be if someone did disclose and the same for sexual violence. It could also be having a proactive sexual harassment policy to prevent sexual harassment taking place and also having clear pathways of what would happen if it did. And also looking at appropriate communication. So, for example, a simple emoji could go to four different people and they read that completely differently in a text message. So actually, let's look at appropriate communication in and outside of work. Having appropriate reporting process is also really, really important. What we want to do is make sure that people know that if there is a situation where something does arise, they have a safe and confidential way of reporting. Um, that could be whistleblowing because they might not feel able to report that to a direct line manager and they may not be able to deal with that person direct themselves. They might feel fear or unconfident. They might even feel embarrassed about raising it. So we need to make sure we make it as safe as possible. And in a really practical way, we also need to look at workspace design. We need to think about what physical areas are people working in? Are they having to squeeze around each other? You know, people touch on the waist or on the hip, which is actually a very sensitive area that shouldn't really be touched to move someone. But sometimes people do that to get around a printer or to get to their desk. So having appropriate gaps and also areas where people feel emotionally safe to know that's my zone, that's where I go, that's my safe space is also really important. So these are the numbers um, that are just on here. There's plenty more if people want them for more specific services. But obviously, these are my details and I can share these again. It's not a problem um, if anyone wants to speak to me about further support. Or there's the Samaritans, which is just for general advice. That's 24 hours. And then Anglia Care Trust and the Ferns are two localised services that have 24 hour support lines. Anglia Care Trust have domestic abuse and violence support and the firms have sexual abuse and sexual violence support. And you can ring either of those without giving your name, but just get that first signposting advice. So I appreciate it's a bit of a whistle stop tour, um, but that generally is um, kind of my point of view for today. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, as Marie explained, then obviously um, just give me a shout and I will now disconnect my screen and come back to you, hopefully. So. Thanks, Emma. That was really, really interesting. Yeah, it was um, quite an eye opener in places as well. Um, so, if any, we'd love to have some questions now. If anybody would like to ask some, um, there's two ways you can do it. Actually, somebody's just raised a hand, which is good. There's a raise hand option whereby I can, I'll, and I'll demonstrate in just a moment with Claire, I'll hand over the mic and Claire will join us on the stage as well. She asked the question. If you prefer to, if you click on Q&A, you can type your question if you're not comfortable asking it in person. Um, and obviously, um, chat is there as well if you want it. So bear with me a second. We'll bring Claire up. Am I there? Hi, you are. Um, um, Emma, that's really interesting. As an employer, and we might take this elsewhere, as an employer, if it becomes apparent that a staff member has been involved with domestic violence, mm -hmm. what do we need to do? Do we just need to make them feel safe? Should we be reporting it to the authorities? How can we help? 
So there's a number of different pathways you have, and it's really about risk assessment. Um, and this is part of, and I, I'm sure Bao has the same kind of stuff as well, and I'm sure she'll have a perspective of this, but generally the kind of stuff I talk about when I do the domestic abuse work is about exactly that, because loads of people want to do the right thing, mm. but they don't know what the options are. So if you're talking about a single person who is talking about a previous experience of domestic violence and there's no immediate risk, then I would say get them to an Anglia Care Trust, get them to go to somewhere that's a specialist service. You create a safe space by listening, by validating, by not minimising it. And what that allows that person to do is have autonomy and take control over their environment. So the helpline, for example, the Anglia Care Trust, they will deal with that. They'll give that person advice without needing to take that any further. The time that changes is if there are children involved, if there's an imminent risk of threat. So if they say to you, they've told me they're going to meet me at work today and that's it, I'm at danger, then I would say, say you can support them to ring that helpline and then potentially also call the police. And it will be very risk dependent because, you know, I've worked obviously with domestic abuse services before and sometimes they would call and there'd be an imminent risk of threat. And I would have to say I have a duty to share that, you know, and actually that again is why you need good policy because staff need to be able to know, OK, I'm not ready to have this taken out of my hands but I need some help. Well, actually, if you had a really good policy that said this is what we would do if we knew you were at immediate risk of harm or if they have children, because you have to safeguard children as a guaranteed, they know where their boundaries are with that. They have a choice of what they bring to you. Um, and it actually gives them that control and that power back because the biggest thing with domestic abuse and also sexual violence is the loss of control and the constant... Um, kind of dehumanisation of them really is actually what we need to do is build people to feel really confident to take those steps safely with support and it's not your duty to have to fix that situation but actually by having the good policy by having that kind of really clear boundary of support with them that will allow them then to make those choices but they would also know but at the worst case scenario you will have to report and that's your duty and that then protects you. Right so if we if we knew somebody was in imminent danger it is our responsibility to pick up the phone to the police. Ultimately, yeah, because yeah. if you, it's prevention of, you would be covered is what it would be. It would be your capacity because if you didn't know about it and they came to harm and there was then, okay, actually, well, they told their work or if there was a child, if we're talking about imminent risk, someone is about mm -hmm. to be assaulted, you have a right to call the police at that point and protect them. But I, I think there's always that, the fear that if you do something like that, it's going to make everything 10 times worse. And it, it can. Ultimately, I'm going to be honest about that. It can. But if I was on the phone with one of my clients and they said, my partner is outside the door, that's my boundary because of my policies at work. If your mm -hmm. policy lays out, if you tell us that you are at risk of harm, we will have a duty to share, then that's your cover of your policy. Ultimately, mm -hmm. as, a, as a workforce, if you choose not to report and take that stance, it's about where you sit in your safeguarding duties. So it's about that imminent risk threat. If they're saying they're being stalked, that's often something that goes missing. Again, you want to encourage them to get that support because stalking is often really misrepresented. Mm. Um, it's not picked up for the risk that it is. It's really high risk if you know someone is being stalked. And that stalking could be social media stalking, turning up at work. It could be going out and about, um, watching where their cars are going, just standing outside their houses. All those things in isolation are often quite missed. So again, that kind of policy protection is really important because if you then bring that policy in and get all of your staff to read it, they know what their boundaries are. But if within that you've put a domestic abuse support service, they can go and access that anonymously and they get the, that specialist support advice but you're still being supportive and productive with them. So you're covering kind of all angles of it and you're giving them the choice of what they do and what they bring forward. I think that's really helpful, Emma. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Claire. Right, um, does anyone else have any other questions or would like to ask anything or comment or? I was just thinking about one actually while people are having a think. Um, if you are, say, a manager or a director of a, you know, of a company and sort of flipping it on the other side, rather than kind of the person being abused being one of your workforce, but supposing you've I've witnessed something that's not, oh, I mean, obviously, if it was something really obvious, you would jump on it and do something about it. But if it's just something where you've witnessed things that aren't quite sitting right and you're suspecting that there's things going on, but nobody's making any complaints, mm -hmm. 
how would you deal with that kind of situation? I'd say, again, that's where policy is really important, because actually, if you've got um, like a staff ethics code, for example, like lots of companies introducing company values, company standards. So if you've got something like a diversity and equality um, policy, then actually, you know, that if someone's, say, racist in the office, well, actually, one, it's illegal, but two, here's our policy of work, and actually, here's how you enter into a review process. The same needs to happen with boundaries of the workplace, and that's where a lot of companies aren't accessing professional boundaries training, is because professional boundaries is often only thought of for the sensitive types of industries, so things like care work, or in our work of working with domestic and sexual violence, we have to engage in that, but ultimately... When we're specialists in domestic violence and sexual violence, we're often very cautious about behaving in the workplace anyway. So the professional boundaries should sit really with every industry. So if you get staff coming in and as part of their induction, there is a boundaries policy, there's boundaries training, there's an ethics or behaviours policy, whatever you want to call it. And then staff are not necessarily adhering to that and it's being witnessed you can either revisit that at that one-to-one level with them as part of their boundaries uh, in their PDR or their supervisions and appraisals, or it could be you take a whole force approach, which is where, well, whole force, you can tell I've worked in the police, a whole organisation approach to go, we're going to revisit this and we're going to then maybe deliver a compulsory piece of training that all staff must access, which is to revisit that and then you monitor that person's behaviour. So again, I know it's more policies, but ultimately to proactively protect we need good policy and therefore a good um not punishment process but a way to monitor and maintain that behavior um so it's just about what companies do proactively before it gets to crisis point really brilliant thank you right we've had um a few i don't know if you can see the member but there's been a few comments come up on the chat so everybody's basically saying thank you and really really (laughs) um Right, before we go back to some networking then, are there any further questions or? Just give them a No, so, I mean, obviously Emma will be around till the end of the meeting and she shared her details as well. So um, if you'd rather just sort of ask something one-to-one, then um, you can do that. But thank you once again, Emma, that's been absolutely fantastic. and really really informative so and i'll pop my details in the chat as well so that everyone's yeah. got to know if they want to lovely thank you so um graham will be back on at about 10 to 11 just to close it but in the meantime um i will leave you all to do some networking so thank you very much thanks